and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, England now allows women to take abortion pills at home. We bring you the story. Staying strong in the midst of the church's clergy sex abuse crisis, how do we continue to speak boldly on the church's teachings on life? We discuss and this. We care about what's going to happen to our future. We're not just gonna distract ourselves anymore. Young and faithful pro-lifers from the Franciscan University of Steubenville spread the pro-life message one door and one conversation at a time. But first, we take you to West Virginia, where pro-lifers are calling on Democrat Senator Joe Manchin to confirm Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. In the state called Wild and Wonderful, you don't have to wonder where pro-life West Virginians stand on President Trump's Supreme Court nominee. West Virginians want to see Judge Kavanaugh confirmed. We would like to urge Senator Joe Manchin to confirm President Trump's nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, to the Supreme Court. Confirm Judge Kavanaugh and West Virginia voters are watching and will hold him accountable. We're here outside Senator Joe Manchin's office to send him a message that West Virginians expect him to vote to confirm Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. This West Virginia rally to confirm Kavanaugh to the court is just one of the Susan B. Anthony List's seven state 32 stop tour. We joined up with them from Wheeling to Fairmont, right outside Senator Manchin's office. The Democratic Senator facing reelection walks a tightrope when it comes to the pro-life issue. He's really flip-flop and my understanding is he says one thing at home and does something different when he goes to Washington. One notable example is when last April Senator Manchin posed with a I stand with Planned Parenthood sign. One month later he then stood with a we don't need Planned Parenthood poster with students for life. I am in that photo with Senator Manchin holding this we don't need Planned Parenthood sign so I know firsthand how he can flip-flop and how he can betray us, our, us and the pro-life constituents of West Virginia. The Susan B. Anthony List and other pro-lifers hope to put the pressure on Manchin and other Democrats up for re-election as Kavanaugh faces Capitol Hill hearings this week. For the Democrat in a red state, the life issue cannot be a gray area. Pro-life seems very important. We believe in life. It's important from conception and natural death, truly. A recent poll found 57% of West Virginia voters believe abortion policy for their state should be decided by elected officials in West Virginia. And 59% want Senator Manchin to confirm President Trump's Supreme Court nominee. You know, the senators are not in a vacuum. They know they want to have to be reelected, and they also know that they, they're supposed to represent their constituents. So our people are going to door to door trying to develop some political pressure on these senators to do, frankly, what they ought to do anyway, which is support the will of the people in their states. For a reaction and analysis, we're joined by Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, good to see you. Great to see you, Catherine. Now, these rallies that you guys mm -hmm. are holding are part of a seven-state, 32-stop tour. How are you choosing your locations? Yeah, seven states. 32 stops, it's a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, all that energy is put into those particular states because six of them are states where we have vulnerable senators up for re-election. Um, they are pro-abortion senators. Um, they are uh, big Trump states, st states where Trump won, and we know that by being there, going door to door, talking to the citizens there, we've already reached 1.5 million homes in those places. Um, that it will make a big impact on the uh, on election day about uh, in terms of who wins. We need to deliver a much stronger pro-life Senate so that we can continue to uh, have great votes on judges and pro-life legislation. When it comes to putting the pressure on the senators to confirm Kavanaugh to the yeah. Supreme Court, how are you expecting Senator Manchin uh, to vote there? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to Senator Manchin, it is really difficult to know. I've met with him more than once. He's very good and adept at arguing both sides of the case. He's very good and adept at convincing you that he's on your side even when he's not. He's a very lovable human being. West Virginians like him. I think um, we, it's possible we will get his vote, but until he says that he's voting for Judge Kavanaugh, um, we don't assume anything. He did vote for uh, Justice Gorsuch, which was good. But this is pivotal, this moment where it could be the erosion or overturn eventually of Roe 
um, the left is putting immense, un unimaginable pressure on him and Senator Donnelly from Indiana, mm -hmm. who was another one to keep our eye on, and also Senator Casey from Pennsylvania. Excellent. We'll be sure to keep following those senators mm -hmm. as well. As Brett Kavanaugh begins his Capitol Hill hearings uh, this week, we saw Women's March activists protest it. A lot of pro-abortion senators speaking out about Roe v. Wade. Senator Dianne Feinstein saying, asking Kavanaugh, do you believe Roe v. Wade is correct law? Are there any misconceptions being thrown out there right now regarding Roe v. Wade that you want to address? Oh, yeah. I mean, the strategy of the left, of the abortion rights movement, so-called, is to terrify American women, to frighten um, politicians who might vote uh, in the pro-life direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and wh how do they do that? They do it by saying that immediately as Justice Kavanaugh is confirmed, Roe versus Wade will be overturned, women will be sent to jail, um, their abortion will be immediately illegal 100% in every single state. Now, I w we would pray that that would be true, mm -hmm. but the reality is what will happen eventually, what we believe that, um, that it will be either eroded or overturned, mm -hmm. that about a third of the states will have some very strongly pro-life um, uh, protections. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, of course, know exactly. That's part of what Susan Anthony Lewis is doing right now. Mm -hmm. A third of the states will um, will absolutely reject any um, protections whatsoever. California, New York, Vermont, mm -hmm. etc. And then a third will have a, an intense debate, battleground. This will be pro-life battleground states that we'll be looking at and uh, and making sure that we are allowing in these and all states that the will of the people and not the opinions of judges who are not elected, mm -hmm. the will of the people is allowed to make itself into law. That mm -hmm. is poll after poll shows in all the states that we're in mm -hmm. right now where you visited West mm -hmm. Virginia is one of them. That's what people want. They think the will of the people, not unelected judges, should decide what abortion law is in this country. So what are the next steps? What are the next steps when it comes to confirming Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court? Well, it's moving very quickly. Um, these uh, the hearings will wrap up at the end of this week. Uh, the goal is, of course, to have a new justice on the Supreme Court when this um, session begins, and that will be October 1st. So the vote should be wrapped up by September 30th. That's if it. all goes well. Right, and as you said, this is a pivotal time right That's now right. for all of us to be watching. It is indeed. Marjorie yeah. Dannon Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. The Senate Judiciary Committee began its confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh this week. It cannot be overstated how pivotal of a moment this is for the pro-life movement. For decades, Justice Anthony Kennedy has been a swing vote on abortion. But if Kavanaugh replaces Kennedy on the high court, it would mean having a justice who believes in the Constitution and the right to life. Supreme Court nominee Kavanaugh could be the deciding vote in a possible future case that could overturn the Roe v. Wade decision. With that, here is this week's call to action. Tell your senators to confirm Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Here's how you can do that. Simply go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Type in some of your basic information so we can craft the message to be for your specific senators. And then click Submit at the bottom of the screen. Kavanaugh, a devout Catholic, has served on the D.C. Circuit Court for more than a decade. During his time on the bench, he forcefully rejected the ACLU's assertion of a new constitutional right of abortion on demand for illegal immigrant minors in U.S. custody. And in the case Priests for Life vs. HHS, Kavanaugh refused to apply the HHS contraceptive mandate to religious entities. Let's put the pressure on the Senate to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the high court. Again, the significance here cannot be overstated. Confirming Kavanaugh is a critical step towards possibly overturning the Roe v. Wade decision. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell your senators to confirm Supreme Court nominee Kavanaugh. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. A new government plan in England permits women to take the abortion pill at home, starting at the end of this year. Medical abortions consist of taking two pills that together kill the unborn child. Prior law required women take both pills at a clinic 24 to 48 hours apart. The South Korean government included abortion in a list of immoral medical actions in August as the nation's abortion law was revised, enabling authorities to suspend medical professionals for performing abortions illegally. 
Even though abortion is illegal in South Korea, there are about 340,000 abortions performed annually. The Santo Domingo Archdiocese in the Dominican Republic plans to hold a pro-life demonstration this Sunday in front of the Palace of Congress in the capital. The aim is to show public support for the right to life from conception to natural death, as stated in the DR's constitution. Earlier this summer, hundreds of abortion activists turned out to call for the legalization of abortion. And now to the topic of our global church. It is a hard time to be Catholic right now, as our church is dealing with a clerical sex abuse crisis. There are ongoing allegations that high-ranking church authorities covered up the sexual abuse of clergy, most notably that of Archbishop Theodore McCarrick. And a Pennsylvania grand jury report released last month found some 300 priests abused more than 1,000 children since the 1940s. The Catholic Church's credibility in the public forum has been undermined. Her moral authority questioned because of the diabolical acts from some of the very men called to be our shepherds. So what does that mean for Catholics when it comes to sharing the good news the church teaches? And specifically for the purpose of this program, what does it mean when it comes to speaking on the church's teachings on life? Mary Helen Fiorito is the Cardinal Francis George Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. She was the executive assistant to the late Cardinal until the time of his death in 2015. Mary is also an attorney, a former director of pro-life activities for the Archdiocese of Chicago, and a wife and mother. Thanks for being with us, Mary. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back with you again, Catherine. As we begin this conversation, I first want to give you room to comment on the current crisis facing the church, where is your mind at with all of this? Well, it's, you know, every day I wake up and think to myself, certainly today there's not going to be something new, some new revelation. And for the last 10 days, Catherine, every day there seems to have been a new revelation. And, you know, my faith is not shaken um, because my faith is in Jesus Christ and my friendship with Jesus as my savior, as my Lord. Um, so my faith is not shaken, but certainly, um, you know, it's very disappointing to see that there were uh, shepherds in the church who could have been better protecting the flock and didn't. And so that's very discouraging. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, be objective about it because I worked for the church for so many years and saw firsthand how many good employees and people who were charged in our child protection office were working very hard to make certain that safe environments were created for any of our school children, uh, children who came to us for different ministerial programs, and how priests were really held accountable for any kind of misdeed or misstep they might have uh, made. And I know the church takes this seriously, but by the same token, it seems that um, there, there have been bishops and unfortunately a cardinal who uh, were able to escape the, um, the, the, the norms that, are, that all our priests are held to. And it's, it's very troubling and, and, and disturbing not only to read Archbishop Vigano's 11-page testimony, but also to just even read part of the grand jury report from Pennsylvania. Um, it shakes one to the soul, especially if, like me, you're a mother and you're a mother of children that you've entrusted to the Catholic Church for education and formation. In the immediate days following the Pennsylvania grand jury report, this editorial cartoon appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer. It depicts a bishop looking at a grand jury saying, could we wrap this up? I'm due to instruct our legislators on abortion. The church's moral authority is really undermined right now, Mary, and you can already see her teachings on life being attacked. Can you speak to that? Uh, well, the, I, I had not seen that cartoon, Catherine. I am not entirely surprised to hear that something like it exists, but um, it's very sad to see the media conflating um, abortion and, and this particular issue. To conflate this particular issue with the abortion issue, which of course the mainstream media is always trying to find, you know, hypocrisy on the church's part. And so it does undermine the church's credibility on not just abortion, but on a variety of social uh, justice issues, mm -hmm. you know, including abortion. But 
Um, you know, the church, I, I think the church's position on that particular issue has always been very unpopular with the mainstream mm -hmm. media. If we look at um, the report that was done by, uh, I believe it's David Shaw, the Los Angeles Times reporter, who won the Pulitzer Prize for this, his, his own surveying of people in his own uh, profession found that it was upwards of 90 percent of all secular newspaper and television and radio reporters identified themselves as being pro-choice. So we know that the media is not with the church on this particular issue. Um, so it doesn't entirely surprise me. But, you know, you'd think the media would be more, uh, first of all, more fair, but, but also, um, you know, just in terms of addressing issues separately and not to confuse them and conflate them, because then that confuses the general public, doesn't it? And so that is not the job of the media to confuse the public. It is supposed to clarify and shed light and explain issues to the public, not to try to divert them with red herrings. Amir, I do want to bring up one specific case in the Pennsylvania grand jury report. There was a priest who raped a girl, got her pregnant, and arranged for her to have an abortion. It was not for another two decades that he was removed from ministry. Mary, this is an abomination. And I know I, yeah. as a practicing Catholic, I'm livid over it. Uh, how do you think we should process right. this? And how can we as Catholics address this evil hypocrisy in the public forum without compromising our Catholic faith and her teachings, specifically on life? Right. Well, you know, Catherine, I, I don't know the, the specifics of that case, but even just knowing those details you've shared with me, uh, I mean, my first reaction is, what a disgrace. It's an absolutely disgraceful, um, you know, set of facts, and that a priest would, first of all, violate this young woman. And then, once he had fathered a child, that instead of protecting that child, which is his duty, that, that he would arrange for that child's death. I mean, there there simply aren't enough adjectives in the thesaurus mm. to you know ex to describe that and to react to it. It's an absolute disgrace. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of those sins. I think it cries out to heaven for justice. Mm. Um, and again, this this poor young woman violated not only once by this priest, but violated again by having to go through an abortion and that child's life violated. I mean, I, I pray that that this priest. Um, that, that there was something very wrong with him. There had to be. But mm -hmm. I, I, I hope that that's the case because he is going to have to answer to Almighty God someday at the throne of our Lord. And I pray he has a contrition in his heart and that he, from this point forward, um, I don't even know if he's still alive. You mentioned it was 20 years ago. But, um, but from this point forward, lives a life of prayer and penance. Uh, it will never make up for the violation of that young woman nor the taking of that child's life. But again, you, you can't even begin to put adjectives around such a scenario. It's absolutely disgraceful. And they do not reflect the church and the true beauty of the church, uh, those evil acts. One way, Mary, that Catholic women in particular are responding to the crisis is by signing the letter to Pope Francis from Catholic women. You were one of the original signers. And as of this interview, there are over 31,000 signatures. Can you tell us about it? Oh, well, thank you, Catherine, for asking about it. It's an initiative of an organization that I'm part of called the Catholic Women's Forum, and it's a project of the think tank where I now hold the Cardinal Francis George Fellowship position called the Ethics and Public Policy Center. It's located in Washington, D.C. And the head of the Catholic Women's Forum, a woman named Mary Rice Hassan, who, like me, is also an attorney, really felt moved by the Holy Spirit to respond in a way as a Catholic wife and mother, as a Catholic woman, and so she penned this letter, and a group of us who are sort of part of her advisory council, you know, we went back and forth, and we tweaked here and there and edited it a little bit, and then we decided we would make the letter public. And Mary sent it to me uh, a week ago today in the morning and said, you know, if there's any media interest in Chicago where you are, would you be willing to speak to media? And I said, certainly. And at the time, I think we had maybe 300 signatures. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mary, let's wait till we have 1,000 signatures because that shows a real groundswell behind, you know, this effort. And you know, Catherine, by the next morning, within 24 hours, we had 12,000 wow. signatures. We were astounded. And it simply spread through social media. We didn't, um, you know, utilize parish networks or diocesan networks or Catholic ministry networks. We simply, you know, woman to woman, mom to mom, uh, religious sister to religious sister, shared the letter. And it's been signed by Catholic women of all walks of life, of all vocations. Um, and as you mentioned, we now have 31,000 women who have signed the letter that we hope will go to Pope Francis tomorrow.
Incredible. Mary Fiorita with the Ethics and Public Policy Center, thank you uh, for speaking with us and, and having this conversation with us this week. Well, you're welcome, Catherine. And if any of your viewers who are Catholic women are interested in signing the letter, they simply go to womenwantanswers.com, and you can add your name to the list of women who want to ask the Holy Father for truth and transparency surrounding these sexual abuse allegations. Excellent. We'll put that up on the screen for our viewers. Again, Mary Fiorito, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. When we come back. We really are the pro-life generation. Like, I've had people say, and it's true, our first picture is in the womb. Students from Steubenville boldly share their pro-life passion with strangers door to door. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Abortion is profoundly anti-women. Three quarters of its victims are women, half the babies, and all the mothers. That is a bold pro-life quote from St. Teresa of Calcutta, whose feast day we celebrate September 5th. St. Teresa, pray for us. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. For this week's Speak Out segment, we look at some billboard backlash. This billboard was recently put up in Dallas, Texas by a pro-abortion group, the Afaya Center. It says, black women take care of their families by taking care of themselves. Abortion is self-care. Hashtag trust black women. Let's address the first lie off the bat. Abortion, the destruction of human life, is not self-care. But what's especially alarming is this billboard is blatantly targeting black women for abortion. In 2014, 36% of all U.S. abortions were performed on black women, who make up just 13% of the female population. And if we look specifically at New York City, some statistics show more black babies are aborted than born alive. This demonstrates the toll abortion disproportionately places on the black community. The hashtag on this Texas billboard was trust black women. I do trust black women. I do not trust the abortion industry, which preys on women in need for their bottom line. They are taking advantage of women. The billboard was a response to this. Another Texas billboard from the National Black Pro-Life Coalition, which says abortion is not health care. It hurts women and murders their babies. Abortion advocates say that message shames women, but it doesn't shame women. It simply speaks the truth about what abortion truly does. Remember, there is always something you can do to counter this kind of culture of death. You can follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell your senators to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. Ahead of Election Day this November, the pro-life Susan B. Anthony list will visit more than 2 million homes across the battleground states. A number of those pro-life canvassers include a group of devout Catholic college students from the Franciscan University of Steubenville. I had the chance to walk alongside some of them last week as these young people work to protect our youngest. A big part of the college experience is meeting new people, but this is not in the way you'd expect. We're a pro-life nonprofit organization. I'm just walking around your neighborhood today talking to people about the upcoming election in October. Okay. Um, do you have some time to talk? Sure. Okay, awesome. Emily Coyle just started her senior year at the Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio. She's one of a handful of students from the Catholic College who traveled to nearby West Virginia last week to share pro-life information door to door. Would you want your state senator, Joe Manchin, to confirm Brett Kavanaugh? Um, I don't really know that much about uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Okay, I was just at a house and um, the woman was telling me it's so great to see a young woman out here um, you know, spending your time doing this. And um, she was just genuinely surprised. It's all part of the pro-life Susan B. Anthony List ground game to visit more than 2 million homes across battleground states ahead of election day 2018. Actually looking at another human being, uh, look them in the eye and talk to them, actually seems to have more impact. A political consultant to the pro-life group says the face-to-face -face breaks through the noise. When I first got involved in politics, we called people on the phone and they were delighted to talk to us. Can you imagine? <laughs> Nowadays, you can call 100 people and you're lucky if three will talk to you. 
So what we found is the door to door is much more effective. But if you walk and talk with these students, you quickly realize it's not political strategy driving their footsteps. I really treat it as a prayer because I'm sharing Christ's love with people. I, it's do, doing, doing the work really, really, is, really is a prayer. And, and sometimes I'll find myself saying psalm verses and stuff to myself or like praying right before I enter house to know that it's really all, all in Christ's hands. Canvassing can be a little tough, you know, when it's hot and you're you know, maybe somebody's rude to you and then you realize and you have that like one encounter and like it really, when I have a good encounter with someone, it's like I had that opportunity, like I said, to speak that truth to them and to be, you know, Christ to them in that way and to bring that truth. Um, and for me, that's what it, it comes down to. These students see themselves as evangelizers, encountering strangers, each one getting involved in the pro-life movement for their own personal and powerful reasons. I have known someone who's gone through uh, the decision to abort a baby or not. My mother, she was actually a teenage mom. She got pregnant with me at the age of 17, decided to have me after being pushed to have an abortion. A few years back, my cousin, she was born with trisomy 13 and she died after a month. And so that just kind of put me into a mindset. Like, I've always been pro-life, but that just made me think about Wow, like even though she was out there for a month, she impacted like my whole family. Um, I met this group of atheists that still thought that the pro-life movement was worth it and that the human life had dignity and it was something that we should fight for. And seeing someone that didn't believe in God still say, this is a person, we need to stop this, that had a big impact on me. Whatever the reason, these students know they're not alone along the journey. You know, I say like little prayers sometimes, like Jesus help me get through this, like this is for you, this is something way bigger than me, you're just using me. I usually go right to the Blessed Mother. The intercession of the Blessed Mother, just because her fiat and her yes was so beautiful. A lot of times I focus on the prayer to St. Michael, um, because he's. this is a battle we're in right now. It's like we're taking up arms for people that can't defend themselves. These driven disciples took their beliefs to the road, also attending pro-life rallies held in the same town which is where we caught up with the professor from Franciscan. And so to see all the students here shows me that part of what we're teaching is actually having an effect on the students' lives. They're living it out. They realize that this isn't just uh, something speculative that you consider in the classroom, but it's something that ends up uh, sort of terminating or ending in your feet on the pavement. One door at a time. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, I thank really you. I appreciate what you guys are doing. These students hope their message hits home. It's just so important to defend the human life because that is what it all comes down to. If we do not defend our right to life and defend the innocent who have no voice to speak for themselves, then what are we as a society? That'll do it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, but I'd love to hear from you before next week. Email me at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or like my public page on Facebook so we can keep this pro-life conversation going. Remember, Life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.